But what I've noticed is that critics are only about 3% of your audience. So yeah. just like the people that are, you know, it's like the, it's like a hundred people listen to you. You're going to be three people that just talk shit and make comments and are just rude. Right. So why are you not serving the 97% of people who would support you or need what you want? Because you're so afraid of these 3% jackasses that are saying things or talking about you or being asked. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. This is Jeff Lerner with you as always, and thrilled to be here. And today I am joined by Tony Watley, who I'm really excited to have on the show because genuinely I've been a fan in his world for, it feels like about six months ago, his, his face or name or post popped up into my Instagram world and I've hit follow and, and here I, you know, I've been a fan ever since. He really is doing great work in the world. He's known as the side hustle millionaire after he uh, published a book by the same name that became a number one bestseller. But he, uh, he came by that, that name and that, that idea, honestly. He worked in corporate America for 25 years, had a really successful career. But uh, like you hear this nowadays, and, and we'll dig into it, uh, started some, some quote side hustle businesses and realized that his corporate income was, was no longer required because I think his side hustle businesses had surpassed it and probably were allowing him a lot more fun and freedom and flexibility in life too. And uh, since then, he's been you know, doing coaching, uh, writing, he has a community. It sounds like he was just recently out in my neck of the woods in Zion National Park, which I wanna ask him about, hosting awesome. an event, and just doing a lot of amazing work. Tony, I'm so grateful you're here on Millionaire Secrets. Hey Jeff, good to connect, and it's been mutual. I've been enjoying your content as well and seeing the guests that you bring on your show, and we're on the same path, man. We're out there trying to help people learn from our mistakes and some of the things that we've learned along the way. And I can't wait to help your audience learn some things too. Yeah, I'm, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, it was, it's fun to, to, you know, get to, get to meet people that you kind of feel like you already know and you know your respect and, and vice versa. So, so yeah, let's just, and, and I do agree. I think we're on a very similar mission. Uh, you, you, we were joking before the show and, and actually I wouldn't say it's a joke. It's very serious. Like we're in our forties and life becomes about a few different things maybe in your 40s and you it, you know for anybody out there who's uh 20 20 something and and cynical or not that you have to be young to be cynical but <laughs> you know <laughs> like you really do you get older and you're like I actually want to do some good meaningful things in this world and and you know this is our way of doing that so uh in that spirit why don't you take us back and I'm sure everybody wants to know like how you did it. Oh, you know, you're, you're in the corporate job, but you were never a slave to the corporate world. It sounds like, cause you were already giving yourself permission to start a side hustle. It's easy to start a side hustle once you've made millions of dollars starting a side hustle, but that, that first leap requires yeah. some faith. So, so take us back. Like, like what'd you get into and what drove you to do that? Man, that's a, yeah, that's definitely a good question that'll apply to a lot of different people. And for me, I grew up lower middle class. So my dad was a U.S. Marine, Vietnam vet. My mom's a Japanese immigrant. So I got to see the value of hard work. After my dad got out of the military, he worked in the chemical refineries here in the Houston, Texas area the rest of his career until he retired. My mom was a cafeteria worker in the public school system her entire career. So I got to see that money didn't come easy. And they were basically, I don't think either of them made over $100,000 for their career. And I understood that for me to go out and do something, I had to figure it out for myself. And that's what my parents would tell me. So they said, hey, you need to, we, we, we set you up in a good public school system. You got to figure out the rest. And so for me, we always chased that, you know, middle class dream of getting six figure income, right? It's still the American dream. It's been the same six figure dream since the 1960s. When you think about it, don't people even think about inflation and stuff. And for me, that was like, okay, I guess I got to go to college because my age, 
your age group, we were told if we didn't go to school that we we're going to be failures and we'd probably be digging ditches or hanging on the back of the garbage truck, you know, with those kind of horror stories that we heard. And I said, well, okay, well, I need to figure out how to go to school. And so I put myself through engineering school and it took me seven years. I, I did school part time. I went to at night. And in that meantime, I was working construction in the chem chemical refineries, just like my dad did. And I was waiting tables on the weekends and I was wrenching on cars at a mechanic shop on Saturday mornings through afternoon. So I was working three jobs, that whole 24 seven hustle and grind, going to school at night, sleep deprived, losing my health and my mind really because it was just all these things going on. I was super busy. And when I finally graduated and I got a big boy salary job of $45,000, I felt like it was a part-time job, like these 40 hour work weeks. It felt like a part-time job to me. I was getting home at 4.30 in the afternoon after doing that for seven years. And I was like, well, I could go be a young single dude and chase the bar scene, or I could figure out how to learn some new skills and maybe make some extra money. And I'm saying that because when I started the company, I didn't think about becoming a multimillionaire. I just thought about maybe I could make a few hundred extra bucks a month. And, you know, eventually I did that. I taught myself HTML, how to code web pages and taught myself Photoshop and I taught myself photography with DSLRs and I was out there building these rudimentary three page websites. These were in the early 2000s, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. And so that was my first side hustle as I was working an engineering job. I'd come home and I'd make these little simple websites for car manufacturers and manufacturing speed shops and things like that because I'm a car guy, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what led into me building the, the community that grew in 2001 was ls1tech.com is the largest General Motors performance website on the internet. And it grew to over 300,000 registered members. And through the course of that, it was a, our advertising marketing. We made our advertising revenue. We had over 150 advertising accounts, even Chevrolet and Cadillac, and all of them were advertising with us. And a lot of the people that wanted to advertise with us didn't have a website, but guess who knows how to make websites? So I was basically doing verticals, you know, without even understanding what that meant. And then I started going, okay, people needed me to control their ad buys on different websites because they didn't know how to do that. So I was marketing that. So I was good at building verticals and services within my community. And I was able to take that same business model and build performancetrucks.net, which grew to over 200,000 registered members. Mm -hmm. So I knew that pretty early on, if I could build massive communities that I would attract eyeballs, which would attract revenue, which would create leverage for the things I need to achieve. And the funny thing about this is that when I started those websites, Jeff, my goal was to make $500 a month because that was the car note of the Trans Am that I had bought myself when I graduated college. I said, man, if I could make $500 extra a month, it'd be like having a free car, <laughs> you know? And within six months, it was making about $10,000 a month. And so things just kind of got out of hand from there. So you just bought 19 more Trans Ams, right? <laughs> I, I kind of did, kind of did. <laughs> yeah, I went a little crazy in those times and it was, it was easy to have that kind of money. And Plus with the engineering job that kind of just went through, I was really good at navigating the corporate career. And eventually I was making about 240,000 a year just in my corporate career, but my side businesses were earning between four to 500,000 a year. So I, people always ask me, that's, that's probably the question in your mind, like, why didn't you quit? Why didn't you quit that and just do the full-time mm -hmm. thing? It's because I got really good at making money part-time. And I know you're exceptional at that too, because we like to compress time because we understand time is valuable. But me having a full-time job and later a family and child, and I needed to make money with less time. So I got really good at doing things like that. And so I would build out processes and systems and train other people to do the things that I was you know, previously doing. And I was able to step out of it and actually just use the websites as more of a consumer and a face of the company that would go build the relationships with the advertising accounts and the members and being the leader, but also being immersed into the communities. And so I was able to step out from the day-to-day -day operations and it only took me an hour a day. So people are like, why didn't you quit? It's like, well, what am I going to do for the rest of the day? I don't want to just sit around. I'm, I can go make 200 grand a year with my corporate career and chase the executive role and still make this too. So I kind of just did both. Yeah. That, that, why don't you, why are you doing this? Why don't you quit? Why don't you it, like that, that question? I mean, for, I remember two years ago when I, I sold my agency and I started, you know, what's grown into Entre Institute now. I mean, it was the, that first year was like the, it was the hardest I've ever worked. And yet I just sold my company and mm -hmm. the same questions like, why, why are you doing this? And it's like, what else am I going to do? I, I mean, weren't, I don't know. I don't, I get, I mean, I have a hard enough time taking the entire day off on Christmas day. 
by the end of the day, I'm like, I didn't produce anything today and I'm, and I'm going nuts. And, and I, maybe that's just how some people are, but well, that's, that's a good question. Is that just how some people are? Or is that something that was nurtured and cultivated and that you ultimately figured out you could feed and grow so that that fire would, would not go out or would, would continue to, I guess, burn even hotter? I think individuals on a rare scale are wired like you and I, because you described me too. Like a lot of people think about retirement or vacation and they picture sitting on a beach with a colorful drink with an umbrella sticking yeah. out of it. And they're like, oh, this is great. And, and I think, yeah, that's great for about an hour. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's go do something. Let's, yeah. let's go get on the ATVs or the side-by-sides. I know you're into those. And let's just go do something. Let's go zip line. Let's go scuba. Let's just go do something. I can't just sit there and be static for very long unless I'm reading or doing something that's still being productive. Right. And I've always been that way. I've, I've always been some of a, of a busy body and kind of a daredevil and just always willing to get in and try new things. And I really started being more proactive about facing things that I fear and going and taking those head on and trying to figure out how to overcome those. And that's just really who I am. I'm just kind of that daredevil that tries new things, becomes exceptional at it because I get really driven and really focused at things. And then I can't wait to get the results from like studying those things or practicing or doing the reps. And then once I get the results, I can't wait to teach it. So I like to always pay it forward. So I'm like the teacher that has to prove and lead by example, but that's who I've always been, even as a kid. So, well, actually, and I got to ask for context. So you grew up in Houston. I know you mm -hmm. live, live in Houston, but you grew up there. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and my audience, and I assume you may know, I grew up in Houston too. I didn't know that. Really? No. Okay. Yeah. So, well, so we have, part? And I don't know that it will necessarily serve our audience in such a great way to just yeah. go down that rabbit hole together. But I'm like, I want to know where you went to school and I want to know where you worked and I want to know like all yeah. this stuff. We'll talk about that. But um, yeah, so I, I kind of feel like I have some visuals on, on what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, I, I love that you, I love how casually you talk about making a couple hundred grand a year at a 40 hour job. Mm -hmm. I, I love how casual you are about that. One of my favorite concepts. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with David Goggins. Oh yeah. And he talks about the, uh, the 40% rule, right? How like what, a, when we hit what we think is like hard or we start to, we start to burn or buckle or cry uncle and go, Oh, this is, this is tough. I don't want to keep going. That's usually when you your body is telling you or your mind or whatever that you've hit about 40% of your capacity. Hmm. And so I look at success and I look at the world and say, it's not who does, who does stuff that's hard because have you ever met anybody and said, Hey, do you, do you, is anything in your life hard? Well, everybody thinks life is hard, right? Everybody does the 40 hour job. Everybody has the challenges growing up, everybody, whatever, all you're measured on, all you're valued on is what you do after it gets hard. And so for you, you were doing the thing that most people think is hard, mm -hmm. which is working a full-time job and succeeding at that and thriving at that. And you were going, okay, that's a nice start to my day. Now, what am I going to do? And, and, and whereas for most people, they would go, okay, that's good. I checked the box for the day. Now I can go do happy hour, but that's yeah. life. That's the 40% rule playing out in life. So, so how did you, you know, I, again, I don't know if it's cultivate or develop or I, I, I don't think it's as simple as just saying, oh, well, you were just born that way. How, how are you this person that does what most people consider to be a fully an all consuming hard thing, which is get a corporate job, work at 40 hours, make your money, climb the ladder, go home. And for you, that was just like the warm up to your day. Like, how did you become that guy? Man, it's kind of weird I, because my parents definitely were not wired that way either. So I, I, I think it started out as a child. Becoming an entrepreneur, or what we call that today, to me, that was just a way to facilitate getting new things. So when I was the 10-year-old and I wanted a new skateboard or the newest video game, and I knew that I wasn't going to get any gifts or an allowance until Christmas, which was once a year, or maybe my birthday, I had to figure out how to go make that. So for me, becoming a business owner, well, I was the kid that was knocking on doors, asking if I could mow the yard or wash the car or walk their dogs or do that kind of thing. So that's kind of not entrepreneurship as a child. I would go buy Jolly Ranchers and Blow Pops at the corner store, the whole box, and I would take them to school and put them in little Ziplocs and be like the crack dealer of candy. 
And I would just kind of double my money. And it's kind of funny because the guy that was working at the stop and go, he would see me buying these boxes and I wasn't like a fat kid. He's like, you buy like a box every week. Like, what are you doing with this stuff? And I told him, and here's the funny thing about it is after he, I told him what I was doing, he started giving me a discount. He was actually supporting me as an entrepreneur, as a kidpreneur, right? And so for me, that's the mindset I've always had is like, I could always do more. If I want something else, I can always do more. And what I find is that there's a lot of people out there, Jeff, that don't have that mindset. Like you said, they check the box, like they work their 40 hours, they check the box, there's the income, and they rely on other people to be either pay them more or get a promotion or just kind of go up the corporate ladder. And that's how they kind of increase their income. They think about, I need to go trade my units of hours for units of dollars. And I used to think like that because that's all, how my parents were. They'd, hey, if you want to make money, go get overtime. If you want to get extra money, go pick up a second job. Go pick up a third job. It was always trading your time, trading your time, trading your time. And that's what we call, you know, employee mindset. And a lot of people get stuck in that because they don't know any different. You know, when you and I tell people like, oh, well, you made $100,000 in a weekend. They're like, Psh. they're like, that doesn't even make any sense. You know, it's like, first of all, they think you're full of crap. Second of all, they, they think that's not even possible. And third, they don't believe it's possible for them at all. Like it's not even close. So how do you come up with that? I think that we just get the experience and we start to do the reps. We start to get the results and then we start to get the confidence. And then you start to repeat the results. You're like, hey, there is actually something to this. It's actually a process that you can actually do. It's not luck, you know, but for me, it was like going through corporate and seeing people like I always had like nicest cars at work, right? Because I, I was making outside money. Right. And people that would have the same title as me, maybe senior project manager or a business unit director or stuff like that, they would see the stuff I have and the lifestyle I have and they go, must be nice. We must be paying you too much. And I say, well, no, actually, no, you're, you're paying me the same as you make. Well, how do you afford all this stuff? I say, well, because this is my part time income. Hmm. And it would blow their mind that someone that could have a six figure salary would call it their part time income. And I wasn't saying that to be arrogant, but that was the truth. And the close friends that I'd meet and the colleagues I worked with, I was always giving advice and they saw what I was doing. And they're like, dude, this is crazy. Like making money is really easy for you. And I was like, it's not easy. Like I had to put in a lot of work to get this. This is the result you're seeing after years of putting in the reps, but it's possible. And for me, it was just like, I can go home and sit on the couch and binge watch Netflix for the next two, three hours, or I can go teach myself a skill that I can monetize or do a service or just do something to bring in extra. And then it kind of just grows from there. So, you know, it's, it's a, what do I want and what am I willing to do to get that? And for most people, they just want to hand you an excuse and say, well, I got kids, right? You know, my wife this and that. And it's like, you know what? Show me your calendar. That's not my coach. You're a coach. Just say, show me your calendar. And they're like, uh, what do you mean? I was like, pull out your phone and show me your calendar. Well, yeah, I don't have a calendar. It's like, well, how do you know what time you're wasting or not doing? Or how do you know when you're being productive if you don't even have a calendar? It's like, so for my clients, I was like, hey, let's set up your calendar. And then we'll put every single thing on there that they do. If, if you've got a normal job, there's eight hours blocked out for your calendar, commute times on there, your exercise, your meals, your social time, all that's on there. Because if you're not measuring it, you're going to start to see that you think that you don't have any time. But you and I both know that's the biggest BS excuse there is. So because you asked, I, because I, I like, I really want to illustrate your point. Like it's true. I'm going to show you my calendar. And I, know, I know some people aren't, are just seeing this on podcasts, but like, so this is my phone. This is my day. Yeah, I see it. There you go. Starts at three 30. Oh wait, I'm moving oh. appointments. Uh Oh, and it's color coded, but like it goes to seven 15 from three 30 to seven 15, almost yep. every minute of my day is I've already decided that I'm going to end the day with no regrets and no excuses. Like if there's something that didn't get done today, I will know it's because it literally could not get done today. Right. Or, or because it wasn't the most high priority thing to do today. And I agree. I just think people are capable of so much more than they give themselves credit for. So so in the work that you do, I know that you do events. I know that you do coaching. Mm -hmm. You obviously work with a lot of people, your audience. I, I mean, I'm on, I see the kind of content you put out so I can kind of reverse guess who your audience is. They're, mm -hmm. they're aspirational, they're entrepreneurial, they're, they're 365 driven type of people. Mm -hmm. um, wh how do you work with people to help them understand this? I feel like this is what I do. It's to realize that it's not just changing what you do 
it's growing and evolving who you are. Like it's going to impact everything in your life. You're going to talk, you're going to show up differently with your kids. You're going to show up differently with your wife or husband. You're going to show up differently in your career. You're going to show up so differently in your career that what it, what it might go become, like you said, from full-time to part-time because you have so much more energy and time and resources and abundance now that you realize I've got time for a whole other thing now. Like everything in your life is going to change. And as you said it, people just don't think it's possible for them. So how, what's the work that you do with people to help them cross that first bridge of belief before they can actually get in and do the work in an effective way? The foundation of everything is mindset. You know that. And the first two chapters of my book are on mindset specifically for that reason. And you think about that, people are thinking about, oh, mindset, that sounds foo-foo, right? What are you talking about, mindset? Well, if you study the people who have become successful and all their information's out there, your information's out there, my information's out there, historical leaders or information's out there, you start to see a pattern forming and it's the belief systems that they carry into their success that are pushing away some of the things that they thought they believe. Maybe they picked up from their environment or society or friends or teachers or their parents. And the thing is I always tell people that you need to become a free thinker and you need to challenge every single thing that you believe because the reality is, is that no matter what you believe in anything, even things that are very polarizing, let's say religion or politics, right? Things you're not supposed to talk about on, at the dinner table. Those belief systems are cultivated based on where you were born, who your parents were, and how you were raised. And when you start thinking about that, the, you may feel very strongly about some kind of belief. You may be like, I'm a Democrat, or I'm a Republican, or I'm a Christian, or I'm a Jewish, or whatever you want to say. Understand if you're born in a different household on the other side of the country, or in another, you know, just somewhere different, you probably would have a completely 180 degree different belief system and you would believe in it equally strong. And when yeah. you start to think about that, like, holy crap, we are products of our environment. It's true. So knowing that, kind of take a step back and go, hey, do I truly believe this? Or is this something that I was fed because I didn't have a baseline to compare it to and I absorbed it like a sponge at an early age and I carried it to my adulthood and I just act like I'm firmly believing in this. But you have to ask yourself, does this align with my core values? Does this align with where I want to go? What are the goals that I have in life? Does it align with that? And when you start to do the balancing and looking at, does it really align? You're going to see that a lot of the things that you believe in are just really bullshit in your mind that you start to look like, well, where did that come from? Oh, my friends say that all the time. You know, maybe your friends are the wrong people to hang around with. You know, when you're hanging around with people that challenge the things that you want to do rather than support it, Maybe you're having these people, we always talk about the friend circles and how that matters, but a lot of people hear that and they nod their head like, oh yeah, yeah, your circle matters. Yeah, they get it. But you know what? None of them are willing or courageous enough to push the toxic people out of their circle. They hear that and they go, yeah, that's, that makes sense. But they're not willing to actually take the action to push those people out. I'll tell you a story. 2019, my wife and I were in vacationing on New Year's in Colorado. And we got up that morning on New Year's Day. And we said, you know what? We need a clear house. And she's like, okay, what's that mean? It's like, okay, we know that there's people within our lives. Some people we've known 10, 20 years, family members even sometimes. They're toxic. They don't support you. They golf clap you, but they want to stab you in the back or they talk negatively about you and don't support you. Or they only reply to your post to condescend or argue or criticize what you're doing. Pay attention to these people, okay? They're, they're stealing your energy and they're never going to support you. So we made lists. We said, okay, you go over there, sit on the other side of the hotel room and you go write names that you've deemed as toxic people. And I'm going to write my own list. And since we're married and we trust each other, we're just going to remove those people from our life. This is taking action. Yeah. She had about 12. I had about eight or nine. And we just agreed like, oh, really? That one bothers you? Yep, it bothers me. Okay. We got rid of those people. We, we unfollowed them from Facebook and Instagram and just created barriers that not really spend any time around those people and do things differently. And that's, that's called taking action. Okay. And I'll tell you that the first month or two, it actually was kind of painful. It's kind of mourning, right? Because it's a loss. It's people that you know, and they may be good people, but they're just toxic and they're just drawing energy from you. So you got to think about like, man, I feel like, you know, I kind of feel like I betrayed them a little bit, but kind of don't. And I kind of started feeling it. But about three months in, you start to realize that was the best thing I've ever done. And most people are unwilling and don't have the courage to do that. 
Yeah, you know, I I live I, I live in Utah, and um, you know, it's the the central center of the the world of the Mormon Church is here, mm-hmm. and it's that's the massively predominant prevailing culture and and how people are raised and how they're indoctrinated. And you know, I don't I don't have a dog in the fight. I'm I'm mm-hmm. not taking a position, but I will tell you the number of conversations I have with people who I, I think by virtue of what I do and the fact that I'm not enmeshed in that community here they feel like there's some safety in talking to me and my wife like Mm -hmm. there are so many people that don't believe a word of it but they are terrified to to do anything about changing it in a way that would just create some more flexibility for their life like it's they're so locked in yep and, and and that's a particular religious microcosm of what you're describing but the reality is probably everyone still has some baggage of stuff that was just taken for granted and assumed for their life by the people that reared them or, you know, they, they grew up around that, you know, they, how liberated would they be? But, but yeah, it is, you know, my experience though, is to take it all the way, you know, it's easy to make a few changes. Like I remember this, I I had this friend that told me like they were, they were feeling really shy and, and really like, um, you know, limited in the in the world they weren't they weren't accomplishing what they wanted in this world because they were so shy and so they they made themselves they went to a bar they had a bunch of drinks and they got up and sang karaoke like and a challenge then, like a, like dared each other or no no they did it they yeah. did they i mean it was kind of because of the conversation we had i was like okay you, you okay not like you cannot like if you're gonna keep living this way then you just got to live this way and accept it and be mm-hmm. that but if you're gonna keep complaining about it like, not doing anything. Yeah. You know, yeah. Let's, let's make a change. Right. So they're like, I, so they came back. They're like, I did it. I did it. I, I overcome came my shyness. I sang karaoke. You know, I'm like, first of all, you had a bunch of drinks. So I don't know that that's like <laughs> courage. Well, that's that liquid really courage. Right. About. But then it was like, to them, they had like, they had like checked the box. They're like, yeah. Oh, I'm brave now. Cause I sang karaoke. I'm like, so you did one thing in a fairly meaningless environment powered by liquid courage that didn't actually do anything for your life in the grand scheme, just so you could change the story to yourself and be like, oh yeah, that doesn't really limit me anymore. It's like, no, you're, you didn't go all in on bravery. You went like 1% in on bravery. And because it felt brave and exciting to you, now you're self-satisfied and you're going to stop growing. Mm. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Like to go as all in as on whatever the thing is, as, as I think it really takes, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, it, it generally involves putting yourself out there to a degree that's going to seem weird, for lack of a better way to say it. Like totally, you're gonna be dude. I, yeah, really I successful people are weird. Not everybody likes them. I mean, am I, am I wrong here? I'm weird. You're weird. We're all weird. I yeah, get it. I mean, we're all I as weird it. as we give ourselves permission to I be, it. right? I get it. And oh yeah, dude. So, so how are you? How are you weird, man? Like, what makes you a, a square peg in the round hole of the world? I'm gonna give you good, some good stories because I think this will be really relatable to your your viewers, listeners. But here, I've always been introverted, and I was kind of hidden in the background, and I was always good at executing things from the background, and I never really wanted to stand in the spotlight because, for one, in grade school, I had bullies. And I learned that you just don't do things that stand out because you might get picked on or punched. So you try to do really, you know, high school trying to be popular. You try to fit in. You try to do things just to get along with everybody and make everybody like you, right? So you carry that into adulthood and you realize like, hey, I'm still doing pretty successful things in the background here. And I don't have to put myself out there. And, you know, we all have insecurities and things about we don't like how we look. We don't like how we sound. We don't like our accents or just whatever. Insert blank there, right? And for me, building companies and selling them and making millions of dollars and doing the corporate thing in the background, I had a very comfortable life and I didn't feel like I needed to stand in a spotlight. I was very good at taking photos, but I didn't like being in front of the camera, right? And so one day I was doing a consulting gig for a natural gas company and the vice president asked if I would just go represent them at the safety convention, right? And I said, okay, it's right by my house. I live in the woodlands for your, you know, the Houston okay, area. Yeah, so. Yeah. So I went to the Marriott there and they had a safety convention and there was a thousand people in this room and I was near the front table because we were one of the honored guests for that company. And, you know, he was supposed to be there. I was taking their spot and the guy on the stage asked for an example of something. He started taking some feedback from the audience and I raised my hand and I was thinking like he wasn't going to call me first, but guess what? He called on me first and I never 
really got on a big room like that was, I mean, these round tables, thousand people. It's not like thousand people in rows. It was the round tables, right? Right, right? And so I raised my hand and I'm really close to the stage. So I blurred out the answer and he's like, hold up, let's get this guy a microphone so everybody can hear his answer. And so I'm like, shit. (laughs) <laughs> and so I could feel the body core temperature starting to rise. Oh, yeah. oh, I started yeah. to feel the cotton mouth. I started the, the sweat droplets forming on the top of my head. And the lady with the microphone, it's like, she's like on the other side of the room. She's like walking really slow and it felt like an eternity. And she's just hobbling over towards me. And you know, I take the microphone with my, my cold, sweaty hand. And I, I kind of had a shaky voice and I gave the answer and I, everybody gave the applause and I sat down and that whole process took maybe two minutes. But then I sat down and I was like, what the fuck just happened there? I've never felt this before. And I was like, I didn't think I had stage fright because I've been a leader in corporate world and I've given hundreds of slideshow presentations to a captive audience who are people reporting to me. And I've done the pep talks in front of the team. And I always thought, hey, I'm good at public speaking. I don't need coaching. I got this. My ego said, like, I'm good at this because I had the occasional courage to stand in front of people who were captive who couldn't take a piss break or get on the phone because I was the boss. Right. And I thought I was good at public speaking. But in that moment, when I was outside of my element, in front of a thousand people, asked to stand on a microphone and stand up in front of everybody, I, I felt those physiological signs of fear. And so I was like, holy crap, I have, a, I have a fear of public speaking. And I'm writing a book. What happens if the book does well and people want to interview me or they ask me to come on TV or podcast or stage. It's like, I need to, I need to get over this fear. Like some people would be like, well, shit, I'm just never going to put myself in that situation ever again. I'm just going to avoid taking microphones. Well, for me, I got kind of excited, right? Cause I'm that daredevil type. I'm saying, I found a new fear. <laughs> I got excited. So it's like, I need to go figure this out. How do you get over this? You know? So I joined Toastmasters. This is, this is how you go all in, right? Yeah, so yeah. I joined Toastmasters. That's only an hour and a half a week. So that's not enough reps for me. So I was like, well, what can I do in between? So I said, okay, the things I'm going to learn at the Toastmasters public speaking, I'm going to implement by doing videos on Instagram and Facebook. So I started doing videos and I sucked at it and I knew I sucked at it. But the thing is, I would, I was so afraid of doing that and putting my voice out there. Dude, I used to record these in my truck in the parking lot. I get off work. I still have my tie on from my consulting gig. And I would sit in my truck and I would put the phone on the little stand on the windshield and I would just start talking about something, sharing something or teaching something. And even then I felt really awkward because I was speaking monotone and I'd mess up and I'd flub on my words and I just felt nervous and my eyes would dart around like this and I, and I couldn't look at the lens and it was just kind of weird. Like just, it's like, this is out of my element. And if people walked by in the parking lot, I would turn the shit off and act like I wasn't oh, yeah. doing anything. Oh, yeah. And so that's how the level of like me being fearful of doing these kind of things was. And that was only three years ago. Okay. And so you have to be willing to suck and you have to be willing to do these things. And here's what happened. Okay. I did a video every single day. Sometimes it would take me 10 takes to where I finally got one that I thought was good enough to share. And that was the best I could do at that time. And I would share that. And initially people are like, Hey, you know, good job. And you know, cause they see you're doing something different, right? You're being right. weird. You're being weird. You're doing something outside of your norm and you're like, Oh cool. I've got some support. So it's not so bad after all, maybe this isn't going to be so bad. And you know, that happens to this. It's after about two weeks, like nobody's replying or liking your stuff anymore. And you start to think, is this me? Is there something wrong? Is my message not good? Uh, you know, all these people were golf clapping and giving me likes before, but now they're not even replying. So maybe I'm just sucking. Ah, screw this. I, I, I'm just not cut out for this. And that's how most people think. Like, I'm just not meant out for that. You know, I, I just can't do this. And, and me knowing from business and anything else I've gotten into, I, I know I have an advantage if I just stick it through because most people will quit in that moment. And yeah. maybe if you're listening to this, you started something and you quit two or three months later, you're that person I'm talking to right now. Understand that to win these games, it's a long game. And if you're not willing to commit yourself to at least 12 months of doing that, showing up every single day, which is what I call 365 driven, if you're not willing to start and do it for 12 months, even if nobody looks like they're watching, then don't even start. Because people like me, people like Jeff, we know the advantage of just outlasting you. And if we can get past that hump, we're going to be ahead of 80% of our competition because they quit too soon. And then we'll have to really hang out with the top 20% who are doing some pretty incredible things anyway. So about nine months in, people will start coming back around because you've earned their trust and you've showed that you keep being consistent 
and you're delivering value. And now they go, hey, this person's actually pretty serious about what they're doing. I'm going to start paying attention again because you've earned their respect and their trust. Now they're listening to the message again. They're liking your stuff here and there. And a year in, they're, they're replying, hey, that was a really good message. I needed to hear that today. Thank you for sharing that. 18 months in, a year, two years in, people are starting to tag you and tell their friends like, hey, you need to come check this person out. Come check Tony's stuff out. Come check out Jeff's podcast. Tony, but you need to like do this. And then really about two year mark is where I started to see like I'm getting tagged hundreds of times a day all over the internet by people I don't even know. And it's awesome to see that. And I always try to take the moment to go and like, like their post or just say, Hey, thank you. Because I still want to be approachable and being accessible to the people that are supporting what I'm doing. So these are the tips to building your influence strategy. Most people quit, just quit too soon. They don't believe in it. Yeah. I, I look at, I mean, it's funny. People want it to be sometimes so much more complicated than what you just said, but like, I just love endurance. I love stamina. I'm obs- I just I think those concepts are so fun. And this may sound almost kind of like like a jerk thing to say, but I love I love them because if you obsess over them, you can make them so much easier for yourself than they are for other people that they become your they become your like inevitable advantage. They're such an advantage that they become it creates inevitability that like you will just outlast just outlast, you know, a, a, a hundred yard sprint. I'll never win a hundred yard sprint, but I believe, and I haven't take, I haven't challenged the longest I've ever run is 20 miles. And it wasn't in a competitive race. I just said, I'm going to go run. And I just kept running and I ran 20 miles. You, but, you pulled a Forrest Gump on us. Yeah, I, I went full forest. <laughs> yeah. But, but I believe like, even if I couldn't win a hundred mile race, okay. That just means somebody else hung in there as long. Like, I'm not going to be the fastest, but maybe I need to go another 100 miles. Like, it's some, there's a point where you'll just win because yeah. nobody else hangs in there. And that may sound like misery, but I don't know, man. I think there's just something so, like, like existentially nurturing about yeah. realizing that all progress is happening when it's really, really, when it's so hard that most people have already bailed. That's like to the point, like at the end of the day, it's 430, you're clocking out of your corporate gig. That's when most people have bailed on work. You're just getting started. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, and I, I, anyway, so I, I applaud you. And, and I know what those first couple years of making online clumsy online social content are like. I literally just went, I mean, I'm only two, two years and two months into that process. Yeah. So yeah. I, I feel you, man. But um, it's so cool. It's so cool to see people do that and just become, maybe you can talk about that. I'm so passionate about it. Like, who did you become in that process that you weren't when you started? Other than just, I'm not scared anymore. Dude, it's, uh, it's definitely been life changing because when I started to do the public speaking and, 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 and I hired a speaking coach and doing those things and doing the videos, I was doing that just really to prepare myself to have some kind of a little bit of confidence just in case like this happened, like you and I are on a podcast or someone has me on the radio or a TV and all that has happened. Right. So I was preparing myself to be the right person to carry my message. But what I unlocked is that I really like public speaking and actually developed a skill. And I think it's a little bit of my obsessive compulsive type situation where if I'm going to get into something, I go all in and what I did is I started studying the people that I admired doing that. So I'd watch basically like the game film, right? And I was watching Ed Milet and these people that I admired speaking. And those guys became my mentors. I joined the RTA syndicate and was actually stood on the RTA syndicate stage with thousands of people and was up there talking. So I figure out how do I quickly get to the right level of, I guess, proficiency and who can make that happen and who do I need to learn from? And that's who I became as the person that, was the person afraid of being on stage to someone that actually loves doing something. Like I unlocked something that I didn't think I would love. I just didn't think I was like a necessity. And now I love it. Now I became the president of that Toastmasters club after a year and recruited a bunch of people and saw all their transformations. And we also find from coaching is that, you know, we talk about money and you know, it's nice to make millions. I'm never going to say like, don't go make money. That's not cool. Like, like go make a lot of money because if you want to make big impact, you need to have big money. And for me, 
I was always finding that fulfillment came from helping other people achieve their success. So even there was 12 people in my first company that I built and sold that I helped become millionaires by helping them build businesses within my business. Yeah. So my dream was big enough to create their dream and coach them. And they're always telling me, hey, you should be teaching people this. You should be teaching people this. But it all went back to that. Uh, I've got this job and I've got this family. And uh, it, was, it was really me being a coward is what it was. Mm. I didn't want to put myself out there, right? So I did it privately. And as funny as it sounds is that even in the course of writing that book, Jeff, while it's cool to be an Amazon number one bestseller, and it wasn't like in some bullshit, like, you know, wills and testaments, it was like the business category. So right, it was actually right. legit. And like, like I beat Donald Trump and most people haven't, right? So when you start thinking about the, seeing that up there ahead of Gary V and Simon Sinek and the people I admire, my book was in front of theirs, like, holy crap, this is like a legit thing that's going on. And it changed my life. And here's the funny thing about it is all the accolades, it was really kind of a cowardly play. Now, see, this is kind of weird because most people are like, man, you wrote a book and it became a number one bestseller. Like, how is that cowardly? Well, let me explain. I wasn't the confident person to get on the stage at that time when I was writing the book. I was preparing myself, but I didn't have that. So when you think about that, you can actually write a book and it could become a number one bestseller, but you could do that in secrecy and no one ever has to see your face or your name or anything. Like you can completely hide because think about this. There's New York Times bestsellers and Amazon number one bestsellers. You could literally walk by those people on a sidewalk and you wouldn't recognize them. Yeah. So it's an instant way to get your message amplified and impact people, but you could do it in the shadows. And so that was how I was thinking like, man, I could just put this, like I have this knowledge in my head and all this experience and how am I going to get it out there? Well, I could, I could write a book, mm -hmm. you know, and I could kind of still stay in the shadows and, me joining and doing the Toastmasters and doing the stages and speaking actually extracted me out of the shadows to a skill set that I didn't know I had and became a passion that I like to teach other people to do. So I've changed in many ways just by, I think I get, you get more opportunities in life when you put yourself out there. You'll agree with that. Building a personal brand is very important and it's only going to be more important as time goes on. And it's, it's amazing how few people actually understand that. You know, I'll go speak to these conventions with hundreds of people and I'll ask them, how many of you have done a video to promote your business? And it's usually about 3%. Just, you know, they raise your hand, I'm at 3%, like three out of 100 people. Like, and I'm like, why are you not doing videos? Like, oh, I'm worried about what people are going to say. And all this, this, all the head trash, right? The insecurities, the fear of public speaking. And I get that because I went through all of that, but it's, so uh, crazy to think about now on the other side, it's like, why wasn't I doing this sooner? And I wish I would have done you know, public speaking at 18 instead of my 40s. But it, I changed like that way, just being able to be more vocal and be able to tell my, my opinions and my thoughts more freely. So, I mean, yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, your personal brand is the one thing that in any aspect of your business or, or your career, it's the one thing that nobody can ever say, oh, I've seen that before. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if you, if you sell a, you know, an innovative way to, you know, make, I don't know, get more miles to the gallon out of an engine by, with a gasoline additive, or like, it really doesn't matter. People say, oh, I've heard that before. I, my buddy's a chemist. He told me about that thing or whatever. But like, nobody can ever say they've seen you before. No. Right? You're the one unique card you have to play. And yet you're the card that most people are the most terrified to play. Dude. Um, and they wonder why they're not getting traction in the market. You know, people talk about it's a fear of failure. They go, oh, I'm afraid of failure. We're not, nobody's afraid of failure. You and I both go to the gym. Do you usually fail your last set? Yeah, yeah, of course. You fail every last set. Yeah, you, I try to fail every set. Sometimes you eat unhealthy a meal, you failed. Sometimes you don't do your follow-ups on your business that day and you failed. So we fail every single day at something and we're okay with that. We're like, you know what? I'll just pick it up tomorrow and I'll go harder next time. And, and so we recover from failure pretty easy on a day-to-day -day basis. So what is it we're really afraid of? We're really afraid of what people are going to say about our failure. That's the truth. Nobody likes to admit that because they say that, hey, fear of failure is the surface level excuse that everybody kind of perpetuates. And they talk about that amongst their average aspiration friends. I'm just afraid of failure. I don't have time. All the excuses, that's surface level. But when you dig deep, it comes down to, man, I'm really afraid of what other people are going to say or think about my failure. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that, it's like, wow, would you rather try something and fail and actually have tried and gained some experience because 
nobody's a hundred percent perfect. You know, I talk about, you know, the major league baseball, the top level batters, hall of fame batters only bat 30%. So right. three out of 10 times they stepped up to the plate, they, they, they hit the ball and you know, 70% they failed. And when you think about that, I even looked at my business, I've started nine companies and three of them did very well. But what if I would have quit after the first loser didn't take off, right? Oh, I give up. This isn't meant for me. No, you just take the lessons and you roll them into the next opportunity and you keep getting better. But thinking about people holding you back, that is the number one thing that holds everybody back. It's the number one thing. And you got to realize that you will have critics. I guarantee you have critics, Jeff. You put your content out there. We see the comments. And the thing is that people are so afraid of the critics. But what I've noticed is that Critics are only about 3% of your audience. So yeah. just like the people that are, you know, it's like the, it's like a hundred people listen to you. You're going to be at three people that just talk shit and make comments and are just rude. Right? So why are you not serving the 97% of people who would support you or need what you want? Because you're so afraid of these 3% jackasses that are saying things or talking about you or being asked. So also think about like how many years did I waste hiding in the shadows from these three assholes out of 100 that held me back from my potential in life when if I was to die today, would that be at my funeral? No, they wouldn't. They don't, they're not people I respect, admire, or love me. So why am I, why do I, why do we allow these assholes to hold us back in life, the life we're living right now, and they wouldn't even be at our funeral. So when you start thinking about right. that, it's like, dude, I just need to tell these people to screw off. And I'll tell you, like, even in my group, we celebrate haters. We don't hide from them. We're like, hey, you know what? If you have haters and critics, that means you're finally doing something worth noticing because there's too many people out there that like to be likable and they don't want to make anybody upset and they just play warm, fuzzy middle and they just try to do things and not be polarizing and everybody get along. And that shit doesn't work, guys. It doesn't work. So you got to understand that you will have haters, you will have critics, but you should celebrate that because it means you're finally not obscure and you're finally doing something worth noticing because when you do, you will have those. Amen to that. Bring me some haters, man. Celebrate the hate. Oh, I can't get enough. H haters, was it? They say having anger towards everyone reaching success, right? That's what haters. You'll haters never find a hater doing more than you. Just not. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You can. You, you can measure yourself by the gap between yourself and your haters. I, I have an e I'm looking at an email that the subject line is I'm fucking 12. <laughs> I'm like, okay, why'd you opt into my stuff? And this, the email says, I'm 12, you little creep. Leave me the hell alone. I don't care that you're rich. It's $40, you little asshole. <laughs> I'm like, how did this make it through my filter, first of all? <laughs> but it's like, but yeah, the point, I mean, I get that stuff every day. I try not to look at it, whatever. But I, that one literally came in while we've been on, the, on this conversation. I'm just like, ah, oh, whatever. Hilarious. But yeah, I mean, you're getting attention. Be grateful, man. Like, I promise you, like, what is, what is like the, the, who are like the saddest characters in like books? Think about like Charles Dickens novels. And like, it's the, it's the lowly workers. They're just obscure and they have this quiet, non-impactful life and nobody knows or cares who that like obscurity is death yeah go make some noise get some attention please I, I i love that you're you're you know on that same plane i just if if everybody could just mm, just take it up a level you know if that, if the, that was the, the one thing i could teach sixes make me nuts man yeah if that was the one thing i could teach everybody in this world it would be to just not worry about what other people think and say about them. If I could just give them that one power, it would change everybody's life at once because there's so many people yeah. out there just focused on what other people think. And you know what? Your mom may not be your biggest fan. Your uncle that's talking trash on your comments, he may not ever buy anything from you or refer business to you. And that's okay because, you know, he's older, he's probably going to die before you anyways. So what are you going to do after he's dead? You're going right. to be like, well, my uncle Charlie like screwed my life up all my life. And now I'm 55 years old and I'm trying to figure shit out. It's like, no, dude, just push those people out of your life. Limit your access to them and go do what you need to do. Because every person in history who has made a real impact in, in the world has had critics, haters, or murderers. Think about that. Jesus Christ was going around trying to share his gospel, trying to help change the world and improve the world. 
He had haters. He had critics. He had murderers. Martin Luther King trying to go through the civil rights, trying to bring everybody together, trying to make people not see color, doing the great things. Haters, yeah. murderers. So you can be impactful and understand that there's always going to be critics. Nobody is liked by everybody. So don't try so hard to be liked by everybody. Amen to that. So I, I have a question. The marketer in me is, has kind of mentally keeps looping back to something you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And I want to touch on it and then, and then we'll be kind of up on our time. But yeah. um, so you built, I know with LS1, you built a, a community, you have 300,000 plus registered members. And I can't remember the other website you mentioned, you had like another 200,000. So you've built like mm -hmm. these really massive online communities. And typically when, when you think large online communities, like I have a pretty large and growing online community, but everyone in the community knows who Jeff Lerner is, right? Yeah. Like I'm the figurehead of the community, so to speak. But it's not that often that you necessarily hear about, although they're out there, the reason you don't hear about them is because nobody says what isn't. But you built large communities without achieving prominence yourself within those communities. Mm -hmm. Because as to your point, later when you wrote a book, you're like, oh, I might have to give a talk or something, right? Which meant you have $500,000 worth of community members, or not, sorry, not $500,000, it's probably more than that, but 500,000 community members mm -hmm. worth of audience that don't actually know who you are necessarily, right? How did you do that? Because typically when people think about creating a community, they think about building a brand and then attracting people to the brand into a membership. It was very similar to Facebook. If you think about that, just earlier, because we started in 2001, I sold that company in 2007. Facebook launched in 2008. So it's a really similar business model. Like Zuckerberg's not on your friends list and hanging out with you, but right. the community, right? But for me, I was building project cars. So my cars were part of the draw, right? So I would have like sponsors and advertisers and I built over 40 project cars and those would be in magazines and covers of magazines and we would have racing events. So the people that would come to the events or I would go to the conventions like the performance, like PRI and SEMA, those people got to know who I was because that was how they, we built relationships at the time. But everybody else just knew me as nine ball. That was my screen name because I was a collegiate nine ball champion. And I, I just, they knew me as a persona and they knew my cars. So I was always Tony nine ball guy with a bunch of cool cars. Right. And so that was part of the draw, but how do you build a community that that's one of the questions people come up. How do you build a massive community like that? Well, what I see is people doing things wrong, especially on Facebook groups and even nowadays with communities I see in entrepreneurship at our, at our level, right? Right. I find a lot of people start communities out of ego, right? They want to be sitting on a pedestal and act like they're better than everybody in their community. And mm -hmm. for me, building those math, massive ones, I understood that I had to embed myself as an active member within the community and be a contributing value creator within the community. So I was always the person, even before I started my websites, that would answer people's questions. If I knew the answer, I would take a few minutes, give them a response, maybe refer them to where they can find the information. So I've always been helpful in that regard. And even within Facebook groups before I started this one, I would be in entrepreneurship groups or speaker groups or things like that. And if someone had a legit question, I would just give them the answer. And so if people started to see my name pop up and that's how I kind of grew my other car businesses. So when it came time for me to go start my own business, my own community, they're like, hey, this dude is always answering all of our questions. Like, let's go support him now, right? Mm -hmm. So I built that notoriety and I've always just been that person to answer questions. And I've always been accessible and approachable and just try to just be a part of the community rather than thinking, hey, I'm the king of this place and my ego is super important and you guys are all here for me. It's like, no, because I wanted to make sure that my users and my advertisers had an awesome experience that would entice them to keep coming back. So we were always ahead of it on server speeds and software updates and securities and backups. And we want to make sure they had a good user experience always. And so I was always providing them value and they kept coming back and they got the content and they got direct access to the people that they you know, admired or saw on television and the automotive shows, they were all there. Everybody in the in automotive performance was hanging out on my website. So it was kind of this enticing thing and we would do giveaways. So here's what I'll do a win, win, win. You know, this is a good one because I would look at my sponsors and I would say, okay, I'm going to go talk to these three and see if someone would like to be the featured sponsor for the month. And I would go call them and say, Hey, Jeff Lerner, Lerner performance. 
I'm going to make you the featured sponsor, but you need to give me a $500 gift certificate that they're going to spend with you. But in return, you'll be the featured sponsor and we'll do a drawing for the people who have to be registered to win and they'll get to spend it for you. So I will get more enrollment because people that are lurking, we used to see 50% lurkers versus enrollees. Right. And once we started doing the giveaways, that went down to 25% lurkers because uh-huh. you had to register and have an account to win. And they saw people winning 500, it eventually became like 1500 a month we'd give away, but it didn't cost me anything because the sponsors would donate that because they're gonna spend it with them. So they get a customer, the winner gets a part and we get far more people enrolling. So it kind of just grows that way. You can do that now with your Instagram. I see people doing giveaways that are relevant and Hey, yeah. you gotta be a, you gotta be a member. You gotta be a follower and I'll pick one out of there. And if you could do that, a lot of people built their accounts doing the same thing. Huh? That's, that's some great, that's a great hack right there. Um, I appreciate you sharing, man. I'm glad I asked the question. So yeah, we're, we're kind of at the end of our time, unfortunately, although I, I hope that I get to connect with you off, off the, this recording to ask you all my, my Houston uh, reliving my childhood questions. But how can people get into your world, man, if people want to go get more 365 driven action? I'm very active on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, but all the information is at 365driven.com. So I would just go check out the website. I've got a podcast also called 365 Driven, and I'd be happy to hear from you. And if you do go follow me and listen to that show, send me a note or do a comment and say where you came from, because I'd love to hear and connect with you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tony, this has been fantastic. I'm so grateful that I got to have you on the show. Um, any parting thoughts? We'll, we'll wrap it here, but what's your, what's your final takeaway for everyone? I think I'm going to speak to the person that's maybe been listening to this, that's been thinking about starting a business that has like a lot of, you know, haven't taken the actual first step to actually doing some action. Because what I find in this space, that information is very readily available. And I find that there, with a lot of people out there just consuming information nonstop, okay? They're always buying the next book, joining the next course, watching the next YouTube video, and they're just stacking knowledge, but they're never actually pulling the trigger and actually creating their LLC and buying the domain and creating the website and actually implementing the things they learn. And I always want to tell people is that you don't have to have all the answers. Most people think they need all the answers and they're always looking for the perfect time and all this stuff to to start to do something. So I'm going to challenge you right now. That's you go buy that domain name, go start that website. Even if it sucks at first, just go do something that creates tangible evidence that you're actually doing something instead of consuming information and hiring coaches that you're not doing anything, you're, you probably would actually be doing something if you had a coach, let's be honest, we'll keep you in track. But the, the thing is, you just got to start and you don't have to know the answers. And the best entrepreneurs, and I guarantee you'll agree with this because you're probably the same way, we learn as we go. We just have to, we have to be punched in the face a few times. We have to learn as we go and then you just get better and better and better as an entrepreneur. So don't think you need to know everything before you start. Just start. Amen to that. Don't, don't put your head on the pillow tonight without having done the thing. Awesome. Tony, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for being a guest on Millionaire Secrets. Thank you to all audience members, listeners, and viewers out there. You are the best part of this show and why we do what we do, everyone. Have a great day. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you wanna learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.